Hello, beautiful people, and welcome, hi, to Lenny pre-release. Woohoo! Again, we're doing some hype Fontaine pre-release content. Very excited for Lenny. He's got a fairly interesting kit, which uh, we will be covering. And yeah, let's just get right into it. First thing to look at is his base stats. And I think that Lenny's base stats matter a lot more than they do for a lot of other characters. So if we look at his base stats, Base HP is 1100 HP. Base defense is 538. Let's sort by HP. The lowest HP 5 star character is Ganyu at 9700, but she does have more defense. The lowest defense 5 star character is Baiju at 499, but he has a lot more HP. And he only has 39 more. The consequence of this is that Linny is very squishy. When you actually compare him to Ganyu, if you just assume that they're both starting at full health with no healing, with like the average artifacts, Ganyu is a little bit more squishy, but as soon as you start assuming any sorts of shields or heals, well, those shields or heals aren't based on the character's HP, but the damage that those shields take is based on the character's defense, so Ganyu's defense being higher ends up making her more tanky than Linny. In other words, practically most of the time, he is squishier than Ganyu. And then on top of that, something that we'll get into in a little bit once we look at his kit, is that he has some HP consumption mechanics that will make him not be full HP. So all of this to say, Linny is a very, very squishy character because of his main, his, his base stats. And that is something that is going to matter. I just want you guys to keep that in mind. He has a great rate of ascension. He has a fairly high base attack of 318. Let's get into his actual kit. Normal attack, card force, translocation. Normal attack is just a normal bow. Normal attack, plunge attack is whatever. Charge attack at the beginning is whatever. But he has a special charge attack. So charge attack level two. Fires off a prop arrow that deals pyro damage and upon hit will summon a grin making hat. When firing the prop arrow and when Linny has more than 60% HP, he will consume a portion of his HP to, to obtain one prop surplus stack up to five and the effect will be removed after after 30 seconds out of combat. He cannot drop below 60% of his HP with this though. So if you use it when you're at 61% HP, I think it just brings you to 60% and you get your stack anyways. So that's cool. Basically, if you use his charge level two charge attack when he's full health or at least somewhat healthy, he'll lose a bit of HP to, get, to gain a stack of surplus, prop surplus. This doesn't matter that much, but we'll get into where it matters later. Even if he is not above 60% HP, he will summon a grin making hat. So basically, he does a charge attack, he might consume some HP, and he will always summon a hat. And then the hat taunts nearby enemies up to once every five seconds, and when it's destroyed, or if its duration expires, will fire off basically another arrow that is basically single target. It doesn't really seem to have any form of big AoE, add a nearby opponent dealing pyro damage. Now, if we look at the numbers on this, the prop arrow damage is around 290, it is, sorry, it's around 300. The pyrotechnic strike is around 350. All right, so it's about 650 in total from his special charge attack. Now we can compare him to a character that has a similar thing, right, with Ganyu. Ganyu's Frost Lake arrow is 218. The Bloom is 370. So at the same talent level, she would be at around 590 motion value versus him being at around 650. So he's a little bit higher in terms of motion value. But yeah, so if you just want a baseline comparison for how his unreacted damage will look like before we get into the rest of his kit, you can assume that the baseline is the same as Ganyu for the charge attacks. And then he also has, at certain intervals, the prop arrow will cause a spirit breath thorn to descend upon its location, or its hit location, dealing Numa line pyro damage. This basically isn't actually damage. It's just a way to deal with some of the new enemies' mechanics. All in all, the main thing to remember about this is he has a fairly reasonable amount of charge attack damage, basically. Next up, his elemental skill. Lini does a flourish with his hat, unleashing a firework surprise. Ooh. When used, he will clear all current prop surplus stacks and deal AoE, damage, AoE power damage to opponents in front of him. Damage will be increased according to the stacks cleared, and this will also regenerate Lini's HP based on his max HP. So, when he consumes some of his HP by using his charge attack, he will later on deal a little bit more damage and restore that HP, the same amount that he consumed, right? 20% of the HP, when he uses his skill. If he uses his skill while there's a hat on the field, it will uh, immediately explode, basically. However, it does seem like it makes it explode in actual AoE rather than just the mainly single target default explosion, 
right? As you can see, it will fire off a pyrotechnic strike, dealing pyro damage versus it will cause it to explode, dealing AoE pyro damage equal to that of a pyrotechnic strike. So basically, his E makes one of his second hit of his charge attacks into AoE. Let's move on to his elemental burst. Wondrous Trick Miracle Parade. Unleashing his magic, Linny turns himself into a grin-making cat that can move around quickly. Not to be mistaken with a grin-making hat. So he has a hat and he has a cat. No, he, he has a hat and he is a cat sometimes. When the grin-making, it's grin-malkin, but I don't care. To, to, to me, it, it's grin-making because it's like he's making a grin. You know, he's like... <laughs> uh, when the grin-making cat gets close to opponents, it will send flames falling down on them, dealing at most one instance of pyro damage to each opponent. When the duration ends, he will dismiss the Grin-Making Cat and ignite fireworks that deal AoE pyro damage. Summon one hat and grant himself one stack. In other words, when he uses his burst, he deals damage with enemies he comes into contact with, and when the burst is over, which you can end early, he deals more damage. And he summons a hat, which will also deal some damage. So far, so good. Fairly interesting character. Got a bunch of options that you could go for. However, let's look at his Ascension passives, which are very interesting, right? We'll see that he has passives that are limitations that, in my opinion, are a little bit better designed than something like Nilo's Restriction that I've talked about multiple times. But let's take a look at his first passive. If Lenny consumes HP while firing a prop arrow, the hat will restore some energy and deal more damage. Okay, cool. Conclusive Ovation. The damage Linny deals to opponents affected by Pyro will receive the following buffs. Increase the damage dealt by 60%. And each Pyro party member, other than Linny, will cause the damage dealt to increase by an additional 20%, up to 100%. It's not 20% of 60%, it's just 20%. So it's 60, 80, 100. So, here's why I like this restriction. This restriction doesn't force you to play only specific units on your team, but it does incentivize you to play him in specific teams, right? This damage bonus will only apply when you're dealing damage to opponents affected by Pyro. Now, you can actually fairly reliably keep Pyro auras on an enemy without needing any other Pyro units on your team. Like you could play Lenny, Venti, Kazuha, Zhongli, right? And you would be able to maintain this uptime. Hell, you can even use some reactions that won't completely f*** it over, right? You can use Reverse Melt, and as long as you're not applying too much Cryo, it, it won't remove the Pyro Aura. You can use Burning, which will help maintain the Pyro Aura. But, he still has this very clear, like, hey, this character is meant to be stronger in Mono Pyro teams than in other teams. And that's pretty cool. I like this one. I think it's fairly interesting. It's not, like, particularly creative, right? It's fairly like straightforward. But even then, I do kind of like the idea. It is a nice way of nudging a character towards a specific team while making them very good in that specific team without making them just broken in every team. So I like that, that's nice. So how good is this? Well, now we're getting into the kind of stuff that is very, very difficult to judge before a character's release. If you look at theoretically how many charge attacks you should be able to get out, Linny is very, very strong but he is a very squishy, charge attack focused character. Those of you who play Melt Ganyu often will know that shit doesn't always feel that fun. <laughs> it can feel very frustrating, especially when you're not playing defensive options. When you're looking at the kind of damage output that his teams can have without defensive options, it is actually like very good. Like, this is a very, very strong character. But this is assuming a certain amount of charge attacks are done that practically is likely to be very difficult, if not impossible, to do. It is hard for me to properly judge how strong Linny is going to be. Having looked at his output in teams where you do include defensive utility options, I think he will still be fairly decent in those teams. They'll be pretty brain dead to play as well, right? Because it's, it's Monoparo. Monoparo is pretty straightforward to play, but yeah. All in all, I am fairly excited for Lenny. I am actually considering going for him. I think he does have a pretty cool kit. I'm not going to go for him on day one, right? Most likely I'm going to borrow someone's account to do some testing and I'll decide based on my testing if I'm going to mold the charge attack play style or if I'll be okay with it. But yeah. Basically, right, we have, we, when, you're, when you're looking at how much damage he does, you have to ask yourself, how many charge attacks is he getting per rotation, right? Because his E cooldown is 15 seconds, his burst cooldown is 
15 seconds, that's cool, but realistically, you're probably going to be playing him either with Shengling or with a pyro defensive utility option like maybe Tank Fei or Deya. And we will talk about teams later on and we will talk about how Deya is actually a fairly decent option for him. But anyways, uh, you're probably not getting 15 second rotations, right? You're probably getting generally 20 second rotations instead. Now, how many charge attacks you can do in 20 seconds, you have to keep in mind, well, you need to get your Bennett burst, you need to get your Kazuha burst, you need to get your Deya whatever thing, or your Tangling burst. And so, like, how many charge attacks can you fit in with all of those things that you need to do is going to depend on the player. I expect it to be possible to do four charge attacks per rotation in a 20 second rotation if you're playing very well. And it might be possible to do five with, like, perfect swaps, but the fifth one probably won't have like Bennett buff or something like that. Like it's probably, you're probably gonna be missing out on one of your buffs for the last one. So it might not even be worth it. So I, I would basically assume maybe four, but like I said, right? Especially if you're playing him without the defensive utility options, it might go down to three, maybe even two, and maybe honestly, even one. It's very, very hard to get because he also does have his own burst animation and skill animation that he needs to do, right? And looking at the damage on this, you wanna do this while you still have your Bennett buff. I think that in practice, I would expect more something like three charge attacks with a defensive utility option, two to three depending on how good you are without a defensive utility option. Maybe even one if you're fighting very aggressive enemies. But that creates a very large disparity in terms of how much damage he can output based on those teams and based on the enemies and based on how well you play. Which makes it very hard to properly give him, like probably say how strong he's gonna be. I don't think it's possible for a character like him to be completely useless, but I don't think it's reasonable to expect that the theoretical maximum damage that I can calculate on a sheet is gonna be attainable for the majority of players. It's also important to remember that a lot of his damage is single target, right? His charge attacks themselves are single target and the grin making had the pyrotechnic strike seems to be mostly single target as well, apart from the one that you can explode with his skill. So he does have a majority of his damage being done in, in single target, which means that if you do play him with a defensive utility option, then you're either not using Kazuha for grouping or you're not using Shangling for damage, because you basically always want to use Bennett, which makes you lose a lot of AoE damage. In any case, I do think he's a very interesting character and uh, this is a really cool kit. I like this. Let's move on to... Oh yeah, I guess I can take a look at Constellations as well. Lenny can have two Grin Making Hats present at once. Additionally, prop arrows will summon two Grin Making Hats and grant Lenny one extra stack of prop surplus once every 15 seconds. If you just like only read the first two sentences. This is like the best constellation in the game. Wow, insane. It doubles his damage. And then you read the last sentence and you're like, oh, it's only once per rotation. Oh, it's nice. It basically gets you the equivalent of one more charge attack or rotation. M not even a full charge attack. It's like half of a charge attack because you're not getting an additional prop arrow. You're just getting an additional grin making hack. All right, so it's a little bit more than half of the damage that you're, that you're gaining. It might practically also make it more reliable to get the taunts from his hats, right? It's, it's hard to tell again without before testing it. But yeah, oh, and also from what I understand, it seems like if you do another charge attack while you have a hat out on the field, it will make the old hat explode instantly and spawn a new one, right? It's not gonna just like not do anything. Two, lo locatious cajoling, okay. When Linny is on the field, he will gain a stack of crisp focus every two seconds. This will increase his crit damage by 20%. Max three stacks. This effect will be canceled when Linny leaves the field. That's all right. He has slightly backloaded damage in the sense that when you are going to be on fielding him, I would expect it to be something like you do three charge attacks. If you do three charge attacks, it's like three charge attacks into Q into E, or maybe Q into three charge attacks into E. But the E, makes the hat explode and has a decent amount of damage itself, which means that you, you'll get a little bit more damage towards the end of your rotation than towards the beginning. So getting that crit damage at the end of the rotation is nice. But right, this gives up to 60 crit damage, but even with a slightly backloaded rotation, it's still not the equivalent of actually 60 crit damage in his stats, right? In practice, it's gonna be more like 35-ish percent crit damage, which is nice, reasonable, it's okay. And then we have a very interesting, I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce that, man. Increase the level of normal attack, card force translocation by three, right? So this is not a skill or burst upgrade. This is a normal attack upgrade. The upgrade to normal attacks increase charge attack damage, which is 
instead of about 300, about 350. This is the equivalent of a skill constellation on a character that does most of their damage through their skill, or a burst constellation on a character that does most of their damage through their burst, right? Like that, that's what it boils down to. Constellation 4. After an opponent is hit by Linny's Pyro charge attack, the opponent's Pyro res will be decreased by 20%, which is actually a fairly nice constellation. It's, an, it's another additional nice little thing. Uh, practically, it should be... Assuming that you are playing him with either Kazuha or Zhongli or any other VV unit, it should be maybe a little bit less impactful than this on his personal damage. But if you're playing him with also Shang Ling, or even just like Kazuha's damage in, uh, himself, right? It increases your support's damage as well, not just your own. Which makes this overall, I would argue, slightly better than C3. C5 is alright, right? His burst is a reasonable portion of his damage, even if, it, even if it's not as much as his as his normal attacks. It's nothing crazy, but it's, it's alright. C6, when he fires a prop arrow, he will also fire an additional pyrotech strike that deals 80% of the base pyrotechnic strike damage, which is a fairly good constellation. He, he's got pretty solid constellations across the board. You, you see the 80% and you're like, wow, that's insane. But also keep in mind, right? It's 80% of the hat, but the hat is, is only about 50% of the charge attack's damage. So it's more like a 30 to 40% increase on your charge attack damage. And again, he still does have a reasonable portion of his damage coming from his burst and skill. So this is not like the strongest C6. But this is a good example of a character where, like, the C6 itself isn't insane, but every constellation on the way to C6 is reasonable, which makes the difference between C0 and C6 fairly big. Right? He's the kind of character where, like, he doesn't really have a specific constellation breakpoint. Like, there's no real, like, constellation goal or constellation stopping point for, like, if you're considering going for his cons. It's kind of just, you get however many you want. It's whatever. He's got fairly reasonable, like, increases across the board. Okay. So, now that we've done that, let's get into the good old weapons, artifact stats, artifact sets, and teams. However, unlike in the usual pre-release, we're not going to start with weapons. Because a lot of what I want to talk about with weapons is heavily impacted by the artifact sets. Marie-Chaussée Hunter, or Marie-Chaussée a hunter. They, they, they haven't put the accents here, so we have to guess. Normal and charge attack damage plus 15%. Okay, that's a cool little thing. When current HP increases or decreases, crit rate will be increased by 12% for 5 seconds, max 3 stacks. Oh, Jesus. It is very difficult to properly predict how much uptime Linny will get with this. I would expect about 2.5 stacks average on his damage, but... I am far from certain, right? Because on the first charge attack, you consume your HP before it hits, so you're at one stack. And then on the second charge attack, you consume your HP, and then you get healed back up by Bennett because you the first one brings you to 80, the second one brings you to 60, and that's under 70%, so Bennett heals you back up. So you'll be at three stacks on the second charge attack, but I'm not entirely sure if the first hat will have hit yet. In my calcs, I've just assumed 100% uptime for now because... I'm not gonna be right anyways, so I just might as well not fucking get a headache. But when you have full stacks on this shit, it's broken. Like, it's good enough that it's a competitive and sometimes best in slot artifact on characters that don't use normal and charge attack, if they can keep max stacks on it. This is a lot of stats, if you can get the condition. Point being for this though is, th this is a lot of stats. Even if you assume like two and a half stacks average, it is by far his best option. Like, it is a solid between 10 and 20% ahead of any other option. This is what you want to be using on him, and there is no contest. When he comes out, obviously, you won't have a uh, Marie Chaussée, like, four-piece farmed up already, because either way, like, you're not, at least you're probably not going to have a good one, right? So I'll still mention some other sets for if you want to play him on day one, but just know if you are going for him, this is what you're huh. using. Yes. And then... On day one, right, you can just use whatever you have out of the, like, potential options for him. So, I mean, you can consider, I mean, if you have a Lava Walker set lying around for some reason, right, you can use that. So, four-piece Lava Walker. Uh, you can use four-piece Wanderers Troop. Technically, you can use four-piece Shimanawas, but I'll have to look at what his animation times are like and what kind of cancels you can do. But I do expect his verse to be very much worth using. So I doubt Shimanawas is going to be a good option. Yes, technically. 
This is 40% charge attack damage. If you have a DPC set, sure. You're using him with Yan Fei or Zhong Li, maybe four piece bull light, but yeah. You can also just do two piece, two piece, pyro attack. But all in all, like, these are only there, like, I, I, I'm, I, I've mentioned them, but now I'm removing them. Because this is just for day one, because his, be his, his best set is coming out on the same day as him, so you're not already gonna have him. But there, these are not what you want to do. You want to go for his set. Here's the thing about his set, though, right? Yes, it is significantly better than everything else on him. However, you can get up to 36% crit rate from this, and he has crit rate ascension, which puts him at 60% crit rate at a baseline. Which means, if you're using a crit rate weapon that gives you a lot of crit rate, you're gonna get dangerously close to 100%. And when you're at 100% crit rate, getting more crit rate is bad. And the problem with that is that if you are using a crit rate weapon, you're basically losing one good substat, right? You're losing one potential substat that you can roll into that is good. And that makes your average artifact quality go down and become worse, which means a lot of the crit rate weapons that you can use with him technically can be very good, but in practice, based on what your artifacts are going to look like, they might actually end up not being that strong, right? And that's why I wanted to talk about the artifact sets before the weapons. It's because you're going to see that a lot of the crit rate weapons can be very good on him, but they can also be pretty bad. The thing is, he also gets a f ton of damage percent just from existing. And because he wants to be played in Mono Pyro, you're gonna get Pyro Resonance, you're gonna get Bennett. He also gets a lot of attack percent and flat attack, which means his only good stat is crit damage. <laughs> yes, attack is still good. Yes, crit rate, if you're not using a crit rate weapon or if you are using a crit rate weapon, up to 100% is still good. But crit damage is his best substat and by a decent amount. So the, his average artifact quality maybe won't be that insane. Another stat that can be good on him is energy recharge. That is going to heavily depend on which specific team you're using, but let's very quickly look at uh, how much energy he can be generating, right? So, I'm not 100% certain on his particle generation. I've heard that it was five on his elemental skill. I don't know if it's always five or if it's only five when he has max prop surplus stacks. For now, I'm just gonna assume that it's always five, but just know that I'm not entirely sure if that's actually the case. But yeah, so for now, Let's assume that. So you get energy, you get three when you catch a pyro particle, 1.8 when you don't catch a pyro particle, one when you catch another element, 0 0.6 when you don't catch it, and two when it's a clear particle, 1.2. Okay, team with Dea. All right, with Dea, you can get up to five procs of her E somewhat reliably. Most likely you're gonna get four while he's on field and one while he's not, or maybe three and two. For now, let's be generous and assume four and one. So from Dea, you're getting four and one. Then from himself, you're getting his own five and you're gonna wanna catch them. And then from Bennett, you're probably gonna do QE or EQ. For now, let's just assume one E on Bennett and let's look at what that, uh, what that looks like. And then you're gonna have Kazuha. Let's assume two E's on Kazuha. Uh, let's assume that Lenny is probably catching one of those two. Maybe that's not the case actually. Maybe you don't actually catch them. Let's assume that Dea is on Fav and Kazuha is on Fav, so you're getting two procs of Fav. Neither of them are being fed into Linny though, because that would screw over your rotations a little bit. All right, and that makes your total energy generated 46. His cost is 60. However, he does gain flat energy from this passive. Ideally, you're always over 60% HP when you do a charge attack, so in a three charge attack, Rotation. Oh yeah, that's true, that's true. I should be assuming the clear particles from enemy gem death is, yeah, anyways. Anyways, in a, in a three charge attack, rotation, flat energy is nine, and the ER is gonna be equal to, which makes his ER requirement very low in a team like this. However, they won't always be very low. This is assuming two Kazuha E's, not sure if you can necessarily do that. This is assuming, this is assuming three charge attacks, which very easily might not happen. And this is assuming a team with Dea, which is on the higher side of particle generation for him. Even though Dea's particle generation is pretty piss poor, his options as a last slot tend to not be very good for particle generation. One potential downside with Dea is that her resistance to interruption isn't always very high, it starts very high, but after a few seconds, it becomes a lot worse. Linny's field time is longer than the amount of high resistance to interruption you have with Dea. So if you wanna be using a character 
like Zhongli instead, right? I generally don't really assume that you get good uptime on Zhongli pillar hitting enemies. This is pretty generous, but let's say you get two particles while he's on field and one while he's not. And as you can see, right, already just by changing Daya to Zhongli, our ER requirements shot up by a little bit over 30%. We're still on five, right? So this is still five Zhongli, but the ER requirements become a lot higher. This is one of the reasons why, unfortunately, Zhongli is not that insane in his teams. It's because the particle generation can be just end up being very rough. We can take a look at what happens with Yanfei. With Yanfei, what's happening is you're actually very unlikely to catch Yanfei's particles on him. Realistically, Yanfei's own ER requirements are incredibly high when you're using Shield Fei, and you're probably going to want to do EQ on her rather than QE, and you're going to want to feed her particles to herself. Like, if you're using Yanfei, you likely want to try to make TTDS work, and that makes the ER requirements even worse than with Zhongli. Technically, you could, because Yanfei's skill is 9 seconds, you could fit two of them in a rotation, and you could even battery the second one back into Lenny, which makes his ER requirements go back down to pretty similar to with Daya. And this is fairly reasonable to obtain on just randomly the same way you obtain, like you get like <laughs> flat defense rolls on pieces. This is only f three rolls of energy recharge, and it's pretty easy to just get passively without actively going for it. Whereas this, you will need to actively be going for it. Anyways, point being, uh, when it comes to his def defensive options, some of them will end up playing differently than others, and it's difficult to like objectively say which one is the best. But with some, ER is going to be relevant, and with others, it won't be. If we also take a look at the offensive option, if you would take a look at Tangling. Tangling ER requirements are going to be very similar to Daya. If you're putting Tangling on Fav, which I probably would, Tangling is going to have fairly high ER requirements herself in a team like this. You're going to get maybe three Woba hits while Lenny is on field and one while he's not. Uh, about the same as with uh, TDS Yanfei with two E's in a rotation. At the end of the day though, as soon as you start losing one charge attack, the ER requirements can start shooting up. If you don't kill the enemies as fast, you don't get as many clear particles, they can also start shooting up. If you don't get your five proc, they can start shooting up. There's a lot of factors that can go into how many like how much energy recharge you will actually need in practice. We'll talk about all the defensive options later on once we get to teens. The, I, I just wanted to talk about this first because it is going to impact which weapons can be good. The teams where you do end up like needing higher ER are still reasonably like achievable because like we mentioned earlier, while attack percent is a good subset on him, it's not as big as it is on characters that don't use Bennett in their teams and, and don't use power resonance and all that stuff. And while crit rate is a good subset on him with specific weapons, you'll reach over 100% and it becomes completely useless. But that doesn't mean that you'll necessarily be able to get that. It's just a consideration that it is possible that you have a piece that just works for you with a bunch of ER. In any case, let's move on to his weapons and talk about them. So, let's start by talking about his new signature weapon, the first Great Magic. It is a mid-level base attack, right, a 46 type 5 star with crit damage substat, and it's passive, increases charge attack damage by 16%, and then gives you attack and movement speed based on what elements your party has. Every character that is the same element as the wearer in your party, including the wearer, grants 16% attack, so it's at least 16%. And then if you have two Pyro, including Lenny, it's 32. If you have three, it's 48. And then for the characters that are not Pyro, you gain movement speed, which doesn't really matter. So, right, in his teams where you end up playing him in Mono Pyro with an Animo unit and three Pyro units, you gain 16% charge attack damage and 48% attack. It's his best weapon, right? It is his best in slot. That being said, the gap between the first Great Magic and the second best five star option is not actually that big. And more importantly, the gap between the first great magic and his best four star option in some situations, we'll talk about that in a second, is also not that big. So while this is a great weapon for him, it is far from necessary. Just keep that in mind. And let's move on to the next one. So his second best five star option is going to be Aqua Simulacra for the very clear reason that it's a low base attack five star with crit damage substat, so it gives a lot of crit. It gives crit damage, not crit rate, which means he's not gonna end up running into problems with getting too much crit rate. And it's just a strong option overall. The other options for the five stars, right, you also have Thundering Pulse, which is 
all right, it's fine just because it's crit damage substat, but obviously a big part of the passive is completely useless. You don't want a normal attack on him. Ammo's bow is actually not that great on him. So th the main thing about it is I'm going off of the assumption that his hats are not arrows, so I don't expect them to gain the damage bonus from the second part of Amos Bow's passive. It is possible that they do, but it feels weird because the hat is like a whole ass separate thing. I did look at how it performs with and without this passive on the hats. If you look at it, assuming that the passive doesn't work on the hats, it's pretty bad. Like it's somewhere around the same level as the best four star options. But if you look at it with the assumption that the passive does work on the hats and it does get max stacks, then it's, I mean, it's still not as good as his other five star options, but it does become at least better than the best four star options. So it's decent if it works, meh if it doesn't. Elegy is not really something you want to be using on him. His team's is mainly mono pyro, and mono pyro won't really trigger too many reactions other than swirl, and he's not triggering swirl, so the EM you get from it is like, ugh. it also gives you more ER than you need in most of his teams. It's just not a great weapon for him, unfortunately. And then that leaves us with the crit rate weapons. Now, I did a very early calc of his weapon comparison. By the way, like, don't take the actual number here too seriously, right? I don't actually have any huh. clue if the time that I'm using for my rotation is reasonable. And what we're getting is if you manage to get the same artifact quality without any crit rate rolls, basically, with those crit weapons, they can actually be as good as the crit damage weapons, right? Like Polar Star is gonna be about as good as Aqua, Coward Harp is gonna be about as good as Thundering Pulse. But if you can't, they do end up losing out on a decent amount, especially Polar Star, because it gives a lot of crit rate, right? And even more Hunter's Path, which I, I didn't even bother calculating, because like, if Polar Star is, is about as good as, as, as his best four star, Hunter's Path, which gives even more crit rate, ew, no thank you. <laughs> Anyways, um, the point being, right, with those crit rate options, Polar Star, as good as Aqua, if under 100% crit rate. All right, otherwise. And that's kind of it for the five stars that I would end up potentially playing for him. And then you've got the four stars. So the first thing I want to look at is the new, the new four star battle pass bow. So the Scion of the Blazing Sun. So after a charge attack hits an opponent, a Sunfire Arrow will descend upon the opponent hit, dealing a little bit of damage and applying the heart, heart Searer effect to the opponent damaged by the arrow. Opponents affected by this take 28% more charge attack damage and at R5 it goes to 56%. It's a lot of damage percent. However, it is high base attack, low substat, which means that the fact that it's a crit rate substat matters a little bit less. It is crit rate, not crit damage, which makes it so that you can potentially run into the issue of getting too much crit rate. And most importantly of all, this has a cooldown, and as far as I understand, it also is fairly single target, which means that if you kill an enemy and then the new enemy spawns, you don't have this for the first few seconds. If there's more than one enemy, this isn't affecting the damage that you're getting when you're using your skill, your skill to detonate your hat. Which means that in AoE, in situations where there's more than one way, basically in everything other than boss situations, the theoretical output from this weapon actually can end up falling down quite a bit. It would still generally be a high refine his best option, but because it's a battle pass weapon that is only coming out with him, well, it'll take up until at least 4.4 to fully refine it. There are other battle pass weapons that can be nice in the upcoming battle pass, and even at full refine, it's not really that much better than the other options. I wouldn't recommend this, but it is a thing that you can go for. The other new weapon is the Song of Stillness. After the wielder is healed, they will deal 16% more damage. Because you're playing with Bennett, Bennett doesn't heal you until you're below 70% HP. If you're not getting hit, you're only gonna go below 70% HP after your second charge attack, which means that you won't get 100% uptime on this. But even if you did, it's an attack substat weapon that gives damage percent, and it doesn't give like an insane amount, which means that it's just a whatever stat stick and it's okay. Weapon I do wanna talk about a bit more First off, I want to talk about Prototype Presence. It's no secret that this huh. weapon is broken, right? At R5, 72% attack is just way too much. It's so much that even in a team with Mono Pyro with a bunch of huh. ton of attack buffs, it's still basically toe-to-toe -to -toe with the yeah. new Battle Pass weapon as his best four-star option. But that's assuming the enemy has a weak point. I don't actually know if the new enemies in Fontaine have weak points. 
how many of them do, how many of them don't. I saw a few of them, I'm assuming that the like, the new Hydro whatever thingies that are like similar to Mimics probably don't, and the other enemies probably do, but I'm not entirely sure. The thing about Prototype Crescent is that it's a okay, reasonable-ish option without the passive, but it's not particularly good, right? You will have other options, but if you do get the passive, it's about as good as the other four stars for his best option. Personally, if I were to play him, I would probably use him on Prototype Crescent as a four star option or on Viridescent Hunt. Uh, now with Viridescent Hunt, it is a crit rate weapon and it gives more crit rate than is than the new weapon, which is nice for your total stats, but not nice for the problem of potentially getting too much crit rate. With Viridescent Hunt, you end up with about 88% uh, crit rate to begin with, which means you can only realistically get up to four rolls of crit rate before crit rate becomes a useless stat. Personally, I probably would still use them on Viridescent Hunt because Viridescent Hunt uh, passive is just a really good <laughs> passive. And especially if you end up playing him in Monoparo with Kazuha, there are some situations where you can get fall damage from using Kazuha to knock the enemies up while the Viridescent Hunt effect is going. And when you get a fall damage proc, it feels really nice and it deals a lot of damage because it's a percentage of the enemy's max health. I wouldn't recommend going for something like Hamayumi or Sharpshooter's Oath because, I mean, they're barely even better than Prototype Crescent without the passive, and you will be able to get the Prototype Crescent passive at least sometimes. These are weapons I would generally stay away from. So this is what it would look like for his weapon comparison. At the end of the day, right, a lot of factors will go into what makes each weapon good or bad, especially because of Prototype Crescent, because of his potentially overcapping of crit rate, but there's a lot of weapons that can be good on him, right? If you look at the actual difference between his signature weapon and like the worst of the options that are that I recommend in here, a Viridescent Hunt R1, if you're overcapping a little bit on crit, it's about a 30% difference. Point being, it's not a huge difference and specific factors will influence how good or bad each weapon can be. But yeah, so just keep that in mind and uh, let's move on to artifact stats. So obviously we have looked at his ER requirements. We've had, we made some assum assumptions for that, right? We are assuming three charge shots. It can be less, it can be more. It really will depend on how well you play. And honestly, I have to do some testing on it to be sure of what a reasonable assumption should be. Because it will, at the end of the day, depend on how cleanly you can cancel those animations and all that good stuff. So this is still slightly speculative for the ER requirements. Just keep that in mind. But I would expect in teams with low ER or low energy generation, maybe upwards of like 160% but I generally wouldn't recommend those teams. So I would generally not really be recommending teams where his ER requirements are any higher than like 130-ish, which means that you obviously don't want to go ER sense because that gives you 51.8 more than what you would want. You go attack, pyro, crit. And for him specifically, you almost always want to go crit damage. Even when you're not using a crit rate weapon, if you get a crit rate circlet, that's 24.2 from his ascension, 36 from his set, 31.1, from the circlet, you're already at 91.3, and then three crit rolls and you're over 100%. So you're get, you're running into the same issue as you are with weapons like Polar Star, where you're probably gonna end up over 100% because it's hard to get very good artifacts that don't have any crit rate. And so because of that, most of the time, I would recommend crit damage circlet, not just any crit circlet. I don't think there's reasonably any other thing you could do. I mean, technically you could do like attack, attack crit because he does get a lot of damage percent. If you take a look at how it compares, it's about 5%-ish worse across the board. But obviously, maybe for some reason you don't want to play him with Bennett. Maybe you're using Bennett on another team and you still want to play Lenny on one side. In which case, it's about as good with some weapons, the ones that give a lot of attack percent, where damage percent is better, and some weapons, the ones that give a lot of attack, where damage percent is better, and the ones that give damage percent, like Aqua Simulacra, where attack percent is better, but it's still around the same. So if you're not using Bennett, attack and damage goblet are technically interchangeable, but I don't really see a good reason not to use him with Bennett, other than you have Bennett on your other team and you really want to be playing him. So th this is generally best in slot, and then this is fine in teams without Bennett. And I guess another situation where this can be okay is, well, the new artifact set coming out, right? And it's very possible, right? If we look at how likely it is to get a Pyro Goblet, 5% that a Goblet is Pyro, 10% that a Goblet is crit damage. Because you don't really want to get a crit rate Goblet, while you are more likely to get a crit damage circlet before a Pyro Goblet, you're not guaranteed. So it is very, very possible that you get 
a decent attack percent goblet, while you still don't have a crit damage circlet. In which case, while you're building him up with the new set, you can use that attack percent goblet with an offset crit damage circlet as like a way to transition him into the new set without having to wait until you have a good full set before you <laughs> start gearing him. It's not the optimal build, but it is one thing that you can do while you are building him. Finally, we move on to teams. Now, I've basically not mentioned at all any teams other than Mono Pyro so far, because honestly, I don't think he's very good in teams outside of that. If we look at how his damage output would look like, assuming that you lose his buff, because his buff only works when you attack an enemy up that is currently affected with Pyro, and if you're attacking an enemy that is currently affected with Pyro, you're not triggering a reaction. And if the enemy is affected with Hydro and you vaporize, well, they're not affected with Pyro, so you're not gonna get the up to 100% damage bonus. The amount of damage that you gain from his passive is about 50%. The amount of damage that you gain from triggering the vaporize reaction is 50%. And then you also multiply this by whatever EM multiplier that you have. But keep in mind, right, in order to get this, you need to have a Hydro application that is fast enough to keep up with his Pyro application. I haven't actually looked at his ICDs, but one of two things is gonna happen. I Either he has some ICDs, which means you can't vape all of his damage, which means that you'll gain less damage from vaping than you get from his passive when you're attacking enemies that are affected with Pyro, or he basically has no ICD, in which case there's no f***ing way any Hydro unit can keep up with the amount of Pyro he's applying. Either way, you won't be able to make a team where he's vaping, where he would actually reasonably do more damage than a team in Mono Pyro. And then on top of that, because he's a charge attack unit, he doesn't really synergize that well with any of the Hydro enablers for vape. And it makes the teams harder to play, not just in terms of like how much skill you need to execute the rotations properly, but also more complicated setups take more time to do, which reduces the amount of time that he can spend on field. All of this to say, right, his passive gives him so much damage that he does reach the point where, while you can play him in teams other than Mono Pyro, they are niche teams where you just play them because you want to because it, it's fun or whatever not because it's actually good which is in my basically Nilo's passive done right where he still functions in those teams it's just the damage numbers are smaller which is cool I am going to separate mono pyro in uh three pyro three pyro one animo three pyro jongli two pyro one animo jongli you can also do two pyro one animo one dendro, two pyro, one dendro, jungly. You can do two pyro, one cryo, one dendro. I mean, uh, we don't need to list all of them. I'm just gonna stick to like the baseline, these things, and just keep in mind that jungly can be replaced with another defensive unit like Baiju or whatever, or Lila or anything, or something like that. The main thing with this is this is going to be his his ceiling teams because animal units are kind of strong. Grouping is just inherently very <laughs> broken, but they won't actually be that insane in single target situations. Now, he is good at single target, and when you're playing him with like Bennett, Kazuha, Deya, someone like like Kazuha would be carrying most of the AoE damage, but if you play him with Sang Lang, you end up getting a lot more AoE from just the rest of your team to the point where if you are in AoE situations, you can kind of just replace your defensive option with Sang Lang and just get less charge attacks on him and it's still fine. All in all, this is probably like the main thing that I would do. But when you are in single target, I think it is completely reasonable to consider using stuff like Zhongli instead. If we just look at the total damage output, right? If I take away Kazuha's buff and give Petra buff instead, right? His, his damage output does go down, but it only goes down by less than 10% and puts the defensive utility option in the slot that Kazuha would be using. So if you're in situations with against bosses, you can use Petra Zhongli instead of your animal unit and put Chenling on the team without having to rely on the defensive utility from someone like Dayan. Zhongli is not the only option you can go for, but when you look at the other options that are defensive, right, you're looking at maybe someone like Lila and that becomes a little bit more sus because you just don't get the Petra and you don't get the Res Shred either, which makes things just a decent amount weaker. Uh, but this is actually one of the few teams where playing Zhongli is not actually that big of a hit to your team DPS. That being said though, that is only in single target situations. In basically every other situation, grouping is so broken that 
you just want grouping. You can also look at two pyro, one animo only, right? You can use Petra only instead of Dea as your last slot. Your ear requirements go up, but your output can actually go up as a result as well. Um, if we take a look, right, this is Dea, Kazuha, Bena. All right, so if we replace Dea with Zhongli, right, you would lose the TOM that Dea can be wearing because you would rather be using Petra. Now, you would lose 20% from having one less Pyro, but you would gain 35% from Petra. That's 15% difference. And you would get the Resistance Shred, and which does actually make your damage go up by a little bit less than 10%, but still a decent amount. However, this is before looking at how this affects your EOR requirements, and in practice, I don't actually expect this to be much stronger. I think they're fairly interchangeable. Bea is a newer unit, so less people have her, but she is a standard unit, which means that with time, more people will have her. You can also consider other variations, right? You can consider double Geo, you can consider a, a lot of things like this, but at the end of the day, the main core is you want him with Bennett, basically no matter what, because not using Bennett is shooting yourself in the foot. Bennett is incredibly strong with characters like Linny. And then your last two slots, you're looking for grouping, buffs, defensive utility, damage, and you just choose your remaining two units based on which of these things you want to be focusing on. You can look at Rev Melt, right? Where you use him with Bena and then two Cryo units. The main problem with that is that while in Rev Melt with him, you should have enough power application to not have a Cryo Aura. You likely won't have enough power application to always have your Pyro Aura. So sometimes, basically, when you get two Cryo applications back to back, it removes one unit of Pyro. So if there's one unit of Pyro on the enemy, well, it's gone. And then your next Pyro attack, it might not melt. You might not have Cryo Aura on the enemy yet, but it is hitting an enemy that doesn't have pyro on them and you're losing that, it wouldn't be 100%, it would be 80% in a team with two cryo units, but that's still a pretty huge DPS loss. So I wouldn't really recommend Rev Melt teams with two cryo units. I'd say at most you'd want to use one and use someone like Lila as your defensive utility in Rev Melt and it's fine. But yeah, I would still stick to either three pyro, one cryo, or two pyro, Zhongli, one cryo, or two pyro, Kazuha, or other animo one pyro. You kind of get the idea, right? The last thing I kind of want to talk about is double animo, right? So Linny, Bennett, Venti, Kazuha, basically. That will also be fairly strong. You get even better grouping. It's a lot better at dealing with basically like floors 9 to 11, a lot of the domains, a lot of overworld stuff. So it is a team that you can think about. That being said, I don't really like that too much compared to some of the other options that you could be using instead. All in all, his teams are strong. That's pretty clear to me, but you might have to sacrifice some strength in order to, to get some more playability, right? In any case, I'm still not 100% sure if I'll get him, but I do kind of want to. And if I do get him, I think the main teams I'll be playing him in is three pyro, one animo, changing between Shangling and Dea as the last slot. It gives me a reason to play Dea, which is really nice, because holy f <laughs> that unit is so bad. But getting that pyro particle generation while being defensive utility while being a pyro unit for Lenny's buff is nice for him uh so she does have pretty good synergy with him so even though she's not a great unit it's all right and i, I like playing her i think she's she's a pretty fun character with a really cool design that just got f <laughs> by having terrible numbers so uh, having a reason to use her would be nice and then mono pyro in general is a team that i already play fairly often and i kind of just use shinyan as the as the last slot because i don't really have a great last slot so lenny would fit there pretty well that'll be nice in terms of how he compares to other pyro units for mono pyro, it's gonna depend, unfortunately. Like, I I'm sorry. I'm sorry it has to be this way. I'm sorry I can't give you a clear answer. If you can reliably get three plus charge attacks per rotation, he'll generally be better than the other options in mono pyro. If you can't, he might be worse. I unfortunately can't give you a clearer answer than that before I actually test them myself. I'm sure some of you are wondering how he'll do with Lynette. The answer to that is Lynette doesn't have that great of a synergy with him, but the upcoming Abysses might have us deal with a bunch of dumb, cringe, stupid mechanics, and Lynette's alignment is Uja, whereas Lenny's alignment is Numa. So if you want to have a unit 
that has Ujo alignment to deal with an enemy's mechanics, then you can use Lynette in his teams as the animal slot instead of someone like Kazuha or Venti or Sucrose. But uh, yeah, that's gonna be it for the pre-release. I hope you all had a nice time watching. I'm still very excited for Fontaine. I'll also be recording a Lynette pre-release. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Comment down below whether or not you think that Linny will be better than Klee and the other options that you can play in, in Mono Pyro. Or if you think that I missed a team where he, he might be good. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye, you two.